Good morning, Kelly. Well, good morning. And I enjoyed being the bookend of um, Echo Voices again here for another year because that means I get to listen to all of these great presenters. And um, I'm going to grab the screen here so I can we can talk about what we're doing this year um, because it has been um, it's it's a little bit of a change from a uh, moving away from look for this year looking. Um, not so much at a therapist or an educator or a parent or an AAC communicator's perspective. And this year we're looking at the systems themselves. So we have listened to your feedback. People were saying, you know, it's, it's great finding out how to use them and how to assess, but I don't know what the devices are. You know, a lot of people don't get to go to some of the national and international conferences or, you know, our time is constrained. So we can't always go to the webinars that the various companies have. So we're bringing them to you this year. So we're really going to be going through each of the major companies. Chandra has done a fantastic job at putting everybody in the lineup. Um, but what we want to today is to give you an idea of how to take this information in because it can be very overwhelming to walk through an in-person exhibit hall, let alone a virtual exhibit hall. The, the great thing about the vendor representatives that um, they've got lined up for you is that they are not here to just give you the hard sell um, Sean just talked to them very specifically um, about we want them to go through and explain to us their dedicated devices, their electronic and non-electronic devices, as well as any of the apps that they have that run on tablets and iPads. And as I said, we're going to give you a framework to look at this information comparatively, because depending upon your child or you're the student on your caseload, you might be looking for different components of an AAC system. So you're gonna hear us talking a lot about feature matching. Now we've talked about feature matching in the past and we'll give you some reminders of it, like a low tech session that I did and other things that people have talked about. But that's, one of, that's the way that these vendors are gonna be approaching sharing their systems with you. So <laughs> it's a lot of information to take in. We don't want you to explode. Uh, we want to really give you this kind of, uh, you know, how do I look at not just what it is or who might use it, but what are the benefits to the different types of systems and how they're organized? One of the things that we did is that we looked at a feature match matrix out of Children's Hospital um, in Boston. And they are a long running AAC team. You know, they are well respected in the national and international community. And they have up on their website a feature match checklist. Um, and they also have some videos. I think I've got a slide on all of that coming up. But we wanted to make sure that we were up to date. So we have spent our summer going through this. It's a little bit massive. Um, Chandra has put the link to the blank one in the uh, chat box. I'm gonna do a quick quit out of my slide deck and go over to that, that blank. And maybe if you wanna sign into it and just hold on to your hats, this is fine. <laughs> this, this is the way it's going to work. It really will. Um, and we're going to walk you through it here today and keep walking you through it. Um, as we hear from the different vendors, Chandra's going to be working with them to get this completed for each of the AAC systems that they talk about so that by the end of this 2023-24 year, this is the thing I'm really excited for, we will have this huge chart of all of the current systems. The problem that happens with feature matching will then happen to us next year because devices change. 
So you can go on the internet and you can find people that have done these checklists and fill out the dots and what has what features. But as soon as a company's product line changes, it's out of date. The companies are the holder of the most recent information. They understand that we as educators and speech language pathologists and families are looking at different systems. And it isn't just the system with the most wins, right? It's what matches to what the consumer that you're working with needs. That's what we look at it. How do we set up trials? And we know we in the past we've talked about doing trials and doing assessment. We had a whole year of, um, of echo sessions on assessment strategies. And we're going to be reminding you of those things to go back and look at if you're somebody that's joining us new, that this is something like other duties as assigned. Hi, you are an AAC assessor. Um, you know, the resources are here um, to help you with it. So this big chart is organized We've kind of done color groupings like the original Boston Children's Hot chart did, but we did a little bit of reorganization based upon things that Chandra's been listening to over the year of people asking questions. So one of the first sections, and I'm going to go through each of these individually, and then I'll start giving you some examples. So we'll do the overall view, is looking at the purpose of use. And if there are some of these terms that you don't understand, give us a chance. We're going to explain a lot of this here um, this morning. Platform drives a lot. You know, make some big decisions about systems based upon what platform they're on. So what you'll see that the manufacturers that will be presenting throughout this year will do is that they will, and I'm just going to, I will fix this back. You know, they will put in, say, for example, um, the next manufacturer that is, is the PRC Satillo. And one of the things that they're talking about is, is touch chat. And then what they'll start to do is fill in which of these features that particular product has. All right. So you'll see, and you can keep track of that as well, because we're going to talk about what do you do? with all of this information when it comes down to thinking about your um, child and your caseload. So we will definitely have people look at platform. We're gonna, one of the next most important things is the layout and the structure of language. We're talking AAC here. So how is all this vocabulary organized? It isn't just take a picture and make a talk, take a picture, make a talk. How does anybody find anything, right? And there are a variety of structures. We're going to look at voice output systems, what type of output they have. Some don't have output. You know, we have a lot of no-tech and low-tech systems that become a part of somebody's AAC range of products that they use that may or may not have voice. And then, of course, when there's a voice output, there is a growing number of settings. I said, this is the overview. How are those words represented? What type of symbols? You know, many of us are maybe just used to one or two different kinds of symbol sets. But there are other symbol sets, including text, the alphabet and text is considered a symbol set. So do systems have access to that or they just use one, right? It's important to know. What does the display look like? You know, is it just the symbols? Is there a message window? All those, here, are very hard for me not to just continue to dig in deeper. So we're gonna have manufacturers show their different displays and the adjustments that can be made to displays, right? Lots of customizations that can be done. So many, many of these features have to do with display and symbols. 
And then, of course, this kind of this catch-all grouping of what do you get as a result? What's the feedback? Not just the voice that comes out, but what other things happen um, within a system? Are there any kind of rate enhancements to assist somebody as they are building their message? And sometimes those assists are electronic tricks. Some of them are things that help you find vocabulary. Another big driver that we're going to have manufacturers share with you is who can use this system? What are the motoric abilities that somebody might need? And what are their range of access options? So things like, is it only something that can be you know, physically touched with direct selection, or can you use eye gaze? Can you use switch access? And there's so many different ways in which pe companies break down switch access and touch access that, you know, we want to make sure we've got enough of those terms in here. You know, one of the very tricky things in AAC is the terminology. And that's one of the reasons that we're going at this this year in this particular way, is that depending upon the system, maybe that you were first introduced to, or the system that you use the most, the system that you know, you're the most comfortable and familiar with, you probably know the terminology that that particular vendor floats around a feature. Vendors, have marketing people. And marketing people like to have terms. And this is, I mean, it's not a derogatory thing, right? Marketing people like to have terms that you know when you hear this term that you know what product that you're talking about. So for example, in the world of assistive technology, there is a rate enhancement feature called word prediction. Now, so, and I'm just going to back up to where those things are, right? So we have something called word prediction. Word prediction exists in our writing tools. Word prediction exists in our talking tools. But it looks different. And some companies don't call it word prediction. Some of us learn, maybe we first learned word prediction through a product such as read and write, or maybe we learn it through co-writer. And we and some people don't even know the term word prediction. They know the product. It's kind of like the Kleenex tissue issue, right? Like, do I want a Kleenex? But uh, maybe it really wasn't from that company. So that's what we're going to see as we go and listen to the vendors as what are their terms, for Kleenex, like what are the terms they use for word prediction? What are the terms that they use to explain their message window? Or what are the terms that they use to explain the organization of the vocabulary within their system? So motor terms are the same. So, you know, well, if I've got a student like I do, I have a student that needs switch access. I can't just ask, is it switch accessible? Because there are a lot of products that you can just plug a single switch into. But my particular student needs two switches. One of her switches moves the light to each item. This is called step scanning, right? So she moves it to each item and then she uses her second switch to select it. Not all the products have that. So that's why we really tried to take our time this summer and, and break this down. And we will find that there, there will probably be things that we have missed, huh, Chandra? <laughs> we, there are probably some things that we've missed. <laughs> and it and if that's the case, tell us. Tell us. If there's something you want me to ask these vendors, please tell me. Please. There you go. So as we go through these categories in more in depth now, think about that. Think about something that you were looking for and maybe a term, and we can always add, right? 
there's this big miscellaneous catch-all at the bottom here that is for a lot of those bells and whistles that some companies add based upon their technology. And then of course, we're also, we're thinking about what are some of those built-in supports in addition to the external things that we add to systems like mounting, you know, wheelchair mounting systems. That's the big look at this link um, that you now have access to. Make a copy of it so that you've got it in your own Google Drive. Um, as I said, Chandra's got an original that she will keep. <laughs> And then she will have one that gets built with every session that we have this year, it will get added to. So I guess we're curious as to, before I go into more detail, what your initial reaction is to all of this. Yeah, feel free to unmute. Oh, and, Sarah's and got two know. thumbs up. You can unmute or you can put something in the chat. Like, what do you think about this? It's, it's a lot. It's very comprehensive is the word that I've been giving the vendors. <laughs> I'm like, fair warning. And so I sent it to them and, and nobody has said anything. Um, but yeah, I was, I just wanted to warn them, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be comprehensive. Yeah. So we want to make sure you guys have all the information that you want. And the thing is, is that I'm going to switch back to the, the slide deck, um, is that the vendors have their own forms of feature matches, right? They have things that you can, you know, handouts that you can download off of their web. <laughs> Amy says, yes, it's an, an amazing investigation. It really, I, I'm, ex I'm excited about it. Um but the vendors have these charts that they keep because they know that for at least 30 years, we've been talking about feature matching in AAC. And so they'll have their company products or their apps um, and, you know, all of their systems kind of lined up in a chart. But of course, they're only going to name the features that they cover, right, that their products cover. And so we, we're going to find that there are features that some companies really specialize in and other companies might not have that feature or they might just call it something else because we do run into, here's the list of those groupings I just kind of went through. We do run into um, people that have copyrighted certain terminology, right? People that have patents on their, their knowledge and their technology. So like, for example, the only people that can call something PEX, a picture exchange communication system, are the people from Pyramid, right? Like they own that term. So even though we know that we can exchange symbols using other systems, other companies can't call something PEX. Right. Sarah. Well, I think that I was trying to figure out what a term would be for this this um, concept that I'm interested in. And I think it might be that <clears throat> customization of display, but not really uh, specifically for each student. I guess what I'm thinking about is like as you're creating, say you wanted to adapt a book and put in a link to that or and or you've created a visual scene, which takes a ton of programming to do and then for touch chat you can add that in there um i guess my question is like is there i know there's an other section in your form that you were showing but like a way to talk about the ease of creating your own library of of these resources and then being able to add it into that platform um with i mean i i can imagine how to do that but it would be uh challenging um to say the least, like you would have to, anyhow. So like, so I don't know what the term would be for that, but maybe that the ease of creating your own, um, you know, library catalog of programming. Support. Yes, the specific programming that you so could features add. features like linking are in the list, visual scenes are in the list. So the components that you're talking about, 
that judgment of difficulty level is not, you know, I mean, that's very subjective to the person that's doing it. You know, somebody like you that has a lot of experience with doing it is going to have an easier time than somebody that is just hearing about it now because they're listening to you and going, wow, I want to be able to do that. So I don't think that in this, in, in the list that we keep as the general list, we can do things like easy or hard, just whether it's possible. That's the kind of thing you put in your list, right? So that's why we wanted to make sure that you have a blank so that, and when the vendors are there and they're talking about visual scenes and linking, those are the kind of questions that we want you to unmute and ask the vendor. You know, don't just tell me you have this, show me how you do it, right? And get them to demonstrate that to you. I think that is a wonderful use of this platform that we've got. And so, and as we know, many of the vendors don't have the abilities for visual scenes. I'm doing a pre-conference at Closing the Gap next week on visual scenes. So I kind of got my visual scene knowledge, like right here at the top of my brain right now. Um, and like who does it and who doesn't and who you can only use pre-packaged things. Can I add movies into visual scenes? So those kinds of things, I think asking the vendors, show that to me, right? Don't just tell me you have it, but, but show me that. So here's our overall list. That's going to be a great question. And we, these are the, you know, so I'm just going to go through each of the sections and see what, what things you guys might want to bring up here. So that purpose of use, we know that, you know, we're talking augmentative and alternative communication. So we're talking about expressive communication. But we also know the research behind the values and benefits of individuals seeing other people using their system, hearing information through a system receptively. We know that there are individuals that greatly benefit from people using visuals to talk to them. I'm not just talking about the process of modeling that we've had lots of great past echo voice sessions on. I'm talking about using the system to talk to somebody so if they are a visual communicator. And then of course, some of the growing categories of executive functioning. You know, are you using visuals from the system or a section of the system for scheduling and other types of activities that help with, you know, um, organization and uh, memory and those activities of daily living and, and whatnot. Yeah. So we're thinking about that in systems and, you know, sometimes we're going to have a vendor that has one platform but they might have six or seven presets of how you can use that platform, right? So that'll be that another interesting factor um, to look at with features. Those platforms are, you know, drive a lot. So whether you're looking for something that runs on a Chrome environment or you're looking for a handheld dedicated device, you're looking for something that acts as a smartphone or along with a smartphone or a smartwatch. So, you know, not just iPad apps. We're going to be looking at a variety of tools. I have some of the low-tech things um, on my, I'm just going to spotlight that so you can kind of see and pull that into the side. So that you can get a view of, you know, how, what's the size of it? Is it something that I can can wear? You know, so for many people, just having an, an AAC app that runs on an iPad is not all of the communication systems that they need. So and just and I I've got a slide as a reminder that we've done we did a whole session two years ago on low tech systems and there's a feature match on low tech systems that's created already. So those are really the obvious pieces. 
Then we get into the really, the, the knowledge component. How is the vocabulary? Because we don't want to be starting from scratch, right? We have did that for many years and found out that most of us didn't organize things very well for people to retrieve. And companies have people with great experience in language background. And so we see that vocabulary is organized in different ways. So we have systems that are organized by activities. We have alphabet. We have things that are organized by categories. Gestalt language processing is a big um, hot item now, but looking at can things be put in in phrases that somebody might pull up and full messages, not just in individual words that are put together. You know, are we looking at a linguistic arrangement or a semantic arrangement? So what's the order of language? We know that some of the popular systems are organized based upon motor planning. And there was a great explosion last year in available layouts that were based upon motor planning. There isn't just one company that owns motor planning. There might be somebody that has that term copyrighted, but so for, for those kinds of things, that's what we're gonna be looking at. Are there pragmatic organizations of vocabulary? This is another one that used to just be one product line that was pragmatically organized now there are several. And so taking a look at those. Sarah had mentioned visual scenes. You know, visual scenes for the last 10 years now have been a growing component that sometimes is its own system, but it also might just be one part of an existing system or an add-on. And then, of course, we've tried to add in the other category to be, uh, to be planful of what's coming. The voice settings are really important to many AAC communicators, whether it's a synthetic voice, a digitized voice, the ability for multiple languages. And, you know, many of these companies, especially the big name companies, sell their products in places other than the United States, right? And so there are many languages that some of these products come in. Now, for some of the dedicated products, a language can only happen in an individual system. You can't always move between different languages within the same system. But if that is of value to your and yourself and your clientele, Ask those questions, you know, how many languages can we have in the same system? And how does that impact things like the layout? Because as we know, the words that put together speech in languages don't always go in the same order, right? It's not always personal pronoun, verb, you know, action word, object. Some of those things get changed around based upon the language that's spoken and how that language is organized. Um, and companies have put a lot of time and effort into those um, for those languages, those multiple languages that might be foreign languages to English speakers, not for the person that speaks them. And then, of course, how does that speech come out? Can you pause it? There are some systems that if I'm trying to put together a message, but I need some help, I can pause and go to another screen, not lose my message that I was creating. And I could ask for assistance really quickly or greet somebody that just came into the room. And then I can go back and keep creating my longer message. When does that speak? You know, it does speak. If I'm spelling, do I have to hear every letter? Do I hear it after the word? Does it automatically speak in some of these text based systems when I do punctuation? Does it add inflection when I have a question mark? Does it sound like I'm asking a question with some of the synthetic voices? Um, also, I wanted to add to that voice output piece too, and this is, um, 
this customizing of voice. There, you know, has been this practice of voice banking for several years. And a couple companies are announcing now the ability to do voice banking for a consumer, you know, spend spend a certain period of time, say these 150 messages, and you too can create your own synthetic voice. However, not all of the companies have the ability to utilize that voice yet. So there will be something that will be, um, you know, of great interest, especially for those of you that work with aging populations or populations of individuals that um, due to syndrome or disability are losing their voice. Um, and so you want to capture their own natural speaking voice now um, so that that can be the voice if the consumer so chooses that can be their voice that's in their system. For some of the children on in my caseload that you know have siblings that have buddies, they that speak using an out loud speaking voice, they are asking those family members to record their voice and voice bank it so they can use that in their system. So there's a lot of cool development happening around speech output. But it is important to know that um, whether or not that can be added. And what Chandra's, yeah, Chandra's talk, or, uh, and, uh, talking about the Avaz representative um, that's going to be talking about that. Um, and so they've added voice banking. So there we go. So we're already on our way with some companies. I know that there was a post recently on I think it was on Practical AAC where somebody had gone through which of the companies currently can and cannot use voice banking. So you might want to take a look at that. It was either on the quiet list or it was on the the um, AAC, the Practical AAC. So lots of features to do with speech. Not every tool is going to have every feature. Let's talk about some of the visual features. Symbol representation. You know, there's not a lot of systems that use Bliss, but I do have some people that rely upon the Bliss characters to put together. You know, we for a long time, many people were PCS is the picture communication symbols. That some people call them the board maker symbols, right? But their official term is PCS. Um, and then of course, symbol sticks. We see a lot of symbol stick symbols. Um, unity symbols, clip art, others, you know, Chandra, as I'm saying some of these things out loud, I'm thinking, oh, you know, well, we're, we'll be talking about like lesson picks and things you can make from lesson picks. They have their own symbol set. So you will find companies like the Smarty symbols, you know, that have created their own symbols because of the product lines that they have. And then people's ability to print those out and that they don't have to be overly concerned with copyright to some of the symbol sets that have existed for long longer periods of time. Anything else people have to add to the groupings? I think we're about halfway through the groupings here. It's a lot, right? I think we did a good it's job, a lot. Kelly. But I think one of the important things is that if you have a client that you know they are a symbol sticks user, that becomes something that becomes, you know, whether a product gets looked at or not looked at, right? The idea of all these features is for you to narrow down the, you know, 500 and some AAC products that exist. <laughs> There's more than that, I think. Um, last time I looked in apps, there were over 300 apps that run on an iPad. So how do you narrow that down? It isn't just the, you know, the five most popular ones, because there are reasons for those others to exist. Now, the unfortunate side of 300 and plus apps is some of those were created by people going to college um, to learn how to program 
and they maybe had somebody in their lives that was um, had difficulty with their speech. And so they decided to sit down and create an app for that person because maybe they didn't even know that this whole world of AAC existed. And as sad as that is, we know that that happens over and over and over again. The problem with some of those apps that have been created by, you know, the the semester college um, student is that they often go away when platforms upgrade. So, and they don't always have built-in support. You know, they don't always have a question and answer team. But some of those things that have been developed that way are the hot products that we use now, right? That somebody had a good idea and then they stuck with it. And then they took feedback from consumers and their families and from therapists and from people that were interacting with AAC communicators. And that's how we've had such an explosion in people saying, well, I needed to do this. And then depending upon who's doing the programming, that gets done tomorrow, that night when they stay up till 2 a.m. or next year because they have a whole development team process that they gather features that people ask. Same thing happens with symbols. When you are using a symbol set and you don't have an image that represents the term that you're trying to add into somebody's system, companies keep track of that. And they have programmers and they have artists that draw the new symbols. And usually they do those in batches, right? So it's it's a whole, you know, that's a question to ask. We were talking about displays earlier. This is another world of features that ha that is growing. You know, so first on the left-hand side, the first grouping we looked at with displays and took away from the um, Boston Children's Hospital um, form was what kind of display was it? Is it a group of choice boards? Is it a dynamic display where... I might press one button and then something else comes up on the screen, another button and another, something else comes up on the screen. Is it designed like a grid? Is it, if you think of some of the views, is it a horizontal view only? Can it be a portrait view, right? So can I switch views? Does it have a keyboard? You know, are there lists that you can add to? So some um of the electronic systems have the ability to go to pop-ups that give you related words so if i hit the word walk it might give me a bunch of related words to walk um you know so jogging strolling you know going out and about whatever it might be right so how it does it use pop-ups at all is it printable? You know, not all the electronic systems can you print right from that system. But fortunately, what the manufacturers have done was create printed versions of their core boards or printed versions of their most popular layouts. And they have those up on their website for you to um, print out. And if you can't find those, that's another good question to be asking the representatives is, you know, do you have a no tech version that some that we can print out for as a backup or for when it's not possible for somebody to have an electronic system like in the bathtub or the swimming pool or whatever it might be, depending upon the case you have. So we look at all the different kinds of things that happen with the displays and the speaking of that display. Is there text to speech from the display? Um, and then looking at the customization of those displays. Can you do things that a button might launch an app or a button might launch a video, right? So are those, these are those kind of other features that have been added into some tools over time. Can you change the button shape or is it a square? Is it a circle? Is it something that can be different sizes based upon where it is on the screen. And maybe I, I have um, one student in the past that 
for anything on the right hand side of the display, it could be a smaller size button than on the left hand side of the display. And that was because of visual visual functioning and and physical functioning and the and eye hand coordination. So we needed to have bigger symbols on part of the display than the other side. And not every product can do multi-size symbols on the same display. Now that doesn't mean that those products aren't good. It just means that for the consumer that I was looking at at the time, you know, some products were a possibility and some products weren't. So it just starts to help you cross things out. And then of course, things in displays, colors, borders, high contrast. So that idea of font, are you able to mask or hide symbols? So for some of the AAC systems and the teaching and learning process is to mask items. And so sometimes they call it hide, sometimes they call it masking, sometimes they call it show. So it really depends upon the particular vernacular of that company. Can, what about the keyboard? You know, I mentioned that one of the displays is a keyboard. What's the keyboard layout like? You know, is it a typical QWERTY keyboard? Is it alphabetical? Is it one that's laid out based upon the vowels? And, or do I have different types of layouts that I can pick between within the same system? I have a student that just changed from um, an alphabetical layout that was laid out best for eye gaze to an alphabetical layout that was laid out best for partner assisted scanning, right? And so we went from these big groups to columns, right? But we were able to do that all within her same system. And then some of those feedback features. So what do you get as a result of using it beyond just the speech output if it it's a system with speech output? Is there animation? You know, there are some um, symbol systems that have animated graphics that help to draw attention to the action. Um, actions are, are so difficult to represent in static symbols and um, descriptive words, right? Those kinds of things, quantity related words. And so being able to animate some of those symbols might be something that's helpful in the learning process. Maybe they don't need it all the time, right? Is there any kind of feedback for when I touch the keys? Does it give me an auditory preview? Does it click? Some Because so many of our screens now are membrane flat surfaces, you don't feel keys go down, right? Some people need that tactile feedback. That's a really important feature to them that they feel the press of a key or a little pillow of pressing on a key. Where so many of the systems that are flat, your only feedback is to hear or to get maybe um, uh, one of the companies has like a little a haptic. tactile buzz. Yes, thank you. Haptic. That haptic feedback. Right. Does the symbol enlarge? Right. Some systems, as it's scanning through or as you first select it, the symbol enlarges so that you can see it. And then you touch it a second time before it is selected to speak. So, that what about the auditory scanning pieces? Rate enhancers. This is one where a lot of the terminology is company specific. So abbreviation expansion, I can, rather than always typing my name out, I could just put KF and it would expand to Kelly Foner. Or like, uh, uh, I have a student that has see you and then it's see you later, right? It, for whatever reason, it's not S-U-L, it's see you. And then she, it expands to see you later. Right, and, and PO is peace out. So she's really into the abbreviations or logical letter coding so that I've got the letters of that 
you know, and we are get more familiar with that with some of the abbreviations that we use in texting, right? And some of those kinds of terms and companies take use of that. In fact, those things existed in products. I, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Um, logical letter coding has been in products since the late seventies. Um, and when people started doing, you know, LOL and, you know, really simple ones that in texting, they thought that was something that was brand new. I'm like, yeah, no, we've been doing that since 1978, um, in the AAC world. So <laughs> everything old is new again in some one way or another. Some other cool features that you'll see that companies are really trying to help people with their timing when we look at these rate enhancers, because, you know, it can be wait time that makes and breaks conversations, right? If I'm chatting, the conversation goes so quickly, the topics shift, my communication partners shift really quickly. So that ability to so to store things, not just as individual words or spelling, but to store phrases, things that are interrupters, things that are attention getters, um, that that are things that really help that rate of interaction. Being able to turn prediction on and off in times where you know it's helpful or it's not helpful. Um, looking at how things scroll or swipe to be able to move through screens more quickly um, are really can be really important for the speed of interaction um, in highly social situations. We mentioned motor skills, right? So we've talked about this. Some of it is in the motor skills is how do I attach eye gaze systems? How do I attach switches? Can I do that through Bluetooth? Do I have to have an interface? But, you know, make sure that there's an interface spot that's in that. Do I have to connect something to my iPad or tablet? to be able to do that? Or is it something that I can connect um, built in? And then looking at the different types of motor skills. So the things that go along with eye gaze and using head mice, a mouse itself and a trackball um, and scanning in the different ways. And you'll see them broken down in the next screen. All, what are the kinds of things that we do when we are touching? like double tapping and dragging um, and pinching, right? Those types of um, functions that some, some of our consumers can do. Other consumers might need to use built-in features um, like built into the iPad where I can do that, where I bring up a screen that shows me swipe, drag, pinch, and then I can do use my touch to represent it. So you'll see those different kinds of breakdowns of physical access. And then, of course, the support. What kind of support are you getting from this company? You've invested a lot of time. You've invested a lot of resources, funds. And so how are they assisting you in using it? Beyond, you know, a representative, does that person come on site? It, are there phone calls? Do they have an 800 number? You know, some of these companies are so small, they do not have, especially with things that exist just as apps, they might just exist there to help you with the download. They really aren't educated in being able to teach you how to use it or teach it to a consumer, right? So that's a big difference in many of these vendors as to what kind of support. Do they have loaners, right? So if you have to send a dedicated device in for repair, do they have a loaner program that you can borrow? Um, some of the companies have loaners for your trials, right? Some companies have a light version so that there's like a free version. I can make five screens and then, you know, and, and get an idea of how this works. 
So those pieces are important to know. They are often the make it break it of making a decision about a particular product. And then this growing number of things to do miscellaneously, a lot to do with the internet and interactions, um, like being able to send directly to texting, being able to do any kind of web work. We I have um, some individuals that I work with, not as a educator, but as a colleague that, you know, they're, they earn their living working on the web and they do that through their device, not through, you know, a whole nother interface. So they're able to take advantage of those rate enhancements and the vocabulary in their device as they do their programming. That's that. Those are the groups, right? And it will, will continue to grow. I wanted to make sure that you remember where you can get some help. So for those of you in Oregon, you've got your loan program, right? The loan program through the library system. Chandra can, and, and Deb can talk a little bit more about that. But if those of you like me that are from other states, make sure that you are connected to your loan program. I live here in Wisconsin and our loan program sent out a survey to us last year. What products have you been trying to borrow that we don't have? And they really, last year they focused for us on low tech. Like what kind of low tech things don't we have that you wanna get your hands on before you spend you know, your system resources to buy? So, then the nice thing about many of these low programs, especially like this, this example on the screen is that you can search and you can search different fields. So if you know that you're searching for a dynamic display system or you're searching for something with multiple languages, you can look to see if those terms are a part of what you can search for. Chandra, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add about the loan program here. I have put in the chat a, uh, a s'more link for the OTAP Loan Library. I, I just updated an announcement um, and I, I, I got a little um, crazy when I first started it. I thought maybe I would do this every quarter. I was like, you know what, it's going to be great every quarter. I'm going to put out a new newsletter about the OTAP Library and then you know, I got really busy. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe twice a year I'm going to be able to do it. But I I just um, updated it last night, actually. So there's there's instructions in there on how to use the library. There's links for the form and the library um the listing in the library. So every everything that you need to know is in there. Um, there are some spotlights on switches this um, this time. I uh, I had a good time with that. Um, and it, and it talks about apps and what's new in the library and things like that. So and then I think it has a link at the bottom to our uh, like if you want to know more about AAC. So it'll take you to the YouTube channel so you can you know, see Kelly Fawner's low tech uh, matrix. I particularly liked that session. Actually, I, it was before I started at OTAP, but I went back and watched it. It was great. <laughs> so yeah. And if you have any questions, if you have something you want to borrow and you don't see it, um, call me, email me, I will, I, sometimes I can get those things if we don't have them. Sometimes I have them and they're not in the library list. So let me know. And you know, sometimes I know in some libraries, the way you're searching for it, maybe something's not particularly tied to those terms. And so, yeah, and we're going to be learning lots of terms this year, right? So another way of expanding your search of the library. So that's what we're set up for. Next steps to think about is we're gonna pull from some of those processes of the past. You know, many of our presenters from the past have talked about the set framework. 
the student environment tasks and tools. And they focus on that first part of the student and the environment and the task. But often people don't even know that this tool selection page is there. So the if you continue to look at the, the forms that are part of the set framework, this is the feature match form that um, Dr. Joy Zabala had created. And many of us have used this and we've kind of jumped off of this. So what, when I'm using it and I'm listening and I'm, you know, I've got a particular student in mind and I think about the features that that student needs. So if I know it needs to be run on the large iPad, I need to be able to have a key guard. I need to be able to use PCS pictures. I need to be able to have high contrast. So those kinds of things are what lines up the top of the column. And so those terms or what we have for you and what we've tried to break down for you that are down on that side, you know, in those groupings. And then the names of the tools. So as you hear the vendors over the next couple of months <laughs> present, they say, oh, what tool had that? And whether not just trying to write it down on a scrap, scrap of paper, create this form for your student list the tool that they've said, and then check off which features it has. So that way you're tracking for a particular student the kinds of tools you might need to explore. So here, for example, is from one of my students from the past. So, you know, I needed to know that she could have a core plus activity that was the language structure that was best for her. She needed PCS symbols and we added photos. She had been doing some things with additions with photos, especially like going through the lunch line. Um, she needed to be able to exchange some items because she still was using that kind of picture exchange ex um, approach. We wanted to be able to use recorded output. So that digitized voice and we needed to be able to put color codes. So this is just a, some of the items that were a part of her feature list. And then we started looking at apps. She had been using a GoTalk 20, which is a physical dedicated device that had all of these things. But as many people do, they want to advance in their technology to be able to have more vocabulary than what you might be able to have on one of the kind of mid-tech systems. And so they were exploring three apps that they were familiar with at the time and did it, which of these apps had those features. So that's what, you know, think about what you're doing. And then that helped us determine which products we were gonna trial with her. So that's one way in which it can be used. Um, Chandra said she, she really liked the low tech. Here's your reminder of that link to the low tech feature match list that um, I really want to thank the vendors because they helped me fill it out. Uh, and so it's got, you see how we broke this down was portability because when we're looking at some of the low tech stuff, that's the main reason we're looking at it. Portability, size of buttons, how many levels we had to deal with, what kind of sound and what kind of programming and power controls. There weren't a whole lot, you know, not all of these features that we're looking at um, because they weren't a dynamic display system. But you've got this as another example and a link to the some more that has the um, echo presentation where we introduced this. Some other places to go to. Um, Angela Morad is an AAC specialist. She is fabulous. She keeps up. I mean, she's one of the people that has that time and the connections to keep up on everything that is happening in AAC. She has some things that are free handouts and she has some things that are at Teacher Pay Teacher. When she does some of her big feature match lists and looks at like, what are all the systems that are um, motor planning? You know, those kinds of things. So you will you can find out that information off of her website. And then I mentioned already, but if you haven't connected to Practical AAC, it really is 
a practical resource in our field of augmentative and alternative communication. And I just did a, I did a search on how many posts did they have that mentioned feature matching. And this was from, I think a couple of weeks, you know, like last week when I finished up this PowerPoint. So there were 73 posts that have to do with feature matching. Um, and then they will go back, you know, the whole length of time that practical AAC has been um, in an existence. So really helpful stuff. And then of course they have their um, online component where you get a newsletter of, during the working days and Tuesdays are a link up where you can ask questions and have discussions that are specific to AAC. So I mean, you can get some of your questions answered there. We wanna remind you before we run out of time here in our first session of the 23-24 Echo Voices series to go back that we're going to be, you know, we're going to be focusing on products, right? We're going to focus on products and features. The companies will also mention their trainings that they have. But remember, we have, what, three, four years of those experts in AAC, AAC communicators themselves that are telling you what's important to them. Uh, and you know, those tips for helping families, tips for helping teachers, and all of the different focuses that we've had on assessment and implementation um, strategies throughout the years. Wow. Other things. Woo. I guess we look for comments and questions, other things, Chandra, that you need to to add here in this first session? Oh, I, I think that, that you have done a fantastic job covering it. Uh, feature matching is such an important part of AAC. I mean, you, you just, you can't do it well without feature matching for these, these kids, right? Right. It isn't just about what's the most popular app, right? That might be good for some of your caseload and not the best match and the best fit for other people on your caseload. And I also think that it's important that as individuals hear about new tools, that they have a way to compare them. Um, I learned this feature matching process a long time ago. And so when I get introduced to new tools or or apps have been revised and updated with new bells and whistles, I go back into that, okay, what do I know already? How does this compare to the thing that I know already? What does it have? What doesn't it have? So it really becomes the way that I can look at what's when a vendor's showing me something new and they're all excited and they're trying to you know, do the big pitch on it. It is about, okay, what does this do? What might my student need or not need? What is kind of ancillary to them, right? Anybody have anything that, any thoughts that you want me to include when I'm talking to these vendors? Um, if you get off of here and you think of it, you know, tomorrow, email me. You can email me. Um, yeah, we, we want to know what it is that you want to know. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.